Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church for this, the 18th Sunday after Trinity. Our liturgy this morning shall be morning prayer. It's on page 235, following our opening hymn, hymn 803.
now continue with Psalm 38, as found in the front of your hymnal. Psalm 38, verses 8 through 22, concluding together with the Gloria Patri. We will see this psalm responsibly, whole verse by whole verse. I'm sorry, 34.
the Old Testament reading for the 18th Sunday after Trinity, from Deuteronomy chapter 10. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in Him all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord will set his heart and love on your fathers, and choose their offspring after them. You, above all peoples, as you are this day, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. O Lord, have mercy on us. Mercy to God. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that has, was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. O Lord, have mercy on us. The third reading comes from St. Matthew, chapter 22. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered them. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and, this, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. O Lord, have mercy on us. In many various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. In the name of Jesus, amen. Matthew chapter 22 is a chapter of questions, but it didn't begin that way. There's the parable of the wedding feast, but then the questions start pouring in. Jesus answers the first, one that was designed to get him in trouble with civil government by saying, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. The opening verse of today's gospel lesson says that the Sadducees had been silenced. Their question came next. It's a rather ridiculous and heartless tale that they tell, all 
to deny the resurrection of the dead. Jesus says that they are wrong and know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. The focus of my sermon here at 8 o'clock is the next question. We'll save the final part of the gospel lesson for 10.30. The Pharisees have now decided to gather together. Perhaps you've heard that a Jewish place of worship or gathering is called a synagogue. And that's what the word is here. They synagogued together. They gathered together. And one of them, typically translated lawyer, but it's more accurately a Bible scholar, asked Jesus a question. Does he really want to know the answer to this question? No, I don't believe so. Is he asking his question out of faith? No, I don't believe he is. This Bible scholar has lots of head knowledge and perhaps a heart, but not with regard to our Lord Christ. He asks his question in order to test him, to put him to the test. And that's not a good idea when it comes to a human and the Lord God. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Truly, if this were part of our eighth grade confirmation examination before the pastors and board of elders, this would be 101 in Jewish times. The answer of what the great commandment in the law follows, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is the Old Testament answer. Jesus includes the word mind and calls it the great and first commandment. But our Lord Jesus fulfills all righteousness. He knows that this man was trying to put him to the test in order to get him in trouble. So he answers even more fully with verse 39. And a second great commandment is light. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What's the conclusion? Jesus says in the red type right here in my Bible on the pulpit, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The Old Testament lesson was chosen to go with this particular set of readings, especially the Gospel lesson. And it gives us occasion to talk about a theological perspective that has been out there since ancient times. And a proper distinction of law and gospel helps us understand even better. There are theologians who say, if God commands that we do something, then he automatically gives us the power to comply. No, not true. Such a theological perspective assumes that the law, the law of God, can save. The people of Israel out in the wilderness agreed to keep the covenant of the good Lord. But did they? No. Did they perfectly keep the first commandment between Genesis and Malachi? No, not really for even a chapter, or dare I say it, a verse, as we number them now. The law was not given in order to save. The law of God was given for other purposes. We learn about a pedagogical, a teaching use of the law. You could number it zero if you wish, but that was only temporary until the Christ was to come, until the gospel was revealed in Christ's death and resurrection. But we commonly think about three uses of the law of God. What happens first? 
we usually refer to the curb. Curbs were a thing, even in the ancient world. It helped keep what was supposed to be on the road on the road, and other things not on the road. I'm not just talking about wheels and wagons, unfortunately. We like having guard railings on 14 and 14A, and the other route over the big horns do we not, especially on those hairpin curves. We want to make sure that there's something between us, other than the car door, that is locked and the distance between the car and the really, really too narrow side of the road and the fall that we don't want to have happen. Guardrails are this wonderful thing that help keep cars in bounds. So too with this first use of the law, to keep sin in bounds. If you know there will be a consequence for your sin, the law in the first use acts as a deterrent, a reminder that living in certain buildings in Lusk, Rollins, and Torrington are not the best life choice. But then there's the second use of the law. Sometimes this is called the chief use or the theological use. You could even call it the wedding day morning use of the law. It's a mirror. It shows you exactly what you look like, including a pimple in the middle of your forehead that not even Windex can take care of. The mirror shows you things as they are, but cannot do anything in its power to change them. It calls us to repentance. The law shows us our sin. And at this point, we would end up in hypocrisy, as so many of Jesus' opponents in Matthew 22 end up, or despair, sometimes both, in a surprising sequence. The law shows us our sin, but only the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ shows us our Savior. Maybe you remember that little burgundy book to go along with your dark blue catechism back in the day. S.O.S. and S.O.S. So top Dr. Kerr. Shows our sin. The law cannot save us. We cannot keep it perfectly. And that could lead us to despair. But if we start believing in our heart of hearts that God grades on a curve, then we up in hypocrisy. And that's not how this is supposed to work <coughs> at all. The gospel of God forgives us our sins because of the work of Jesus for us, for our salvation. He gives us what we need. The gospel does not command, it gives. And Jesus says it very well on the cross. It is finished. Even the gospel delivers the forgiveness of sins to us. But we're not yet at the third use of the law, are we? The third use teaches. The third use is like a guide, a road map. And for a forgiven Christian, it sounds like a good idea. Why? Because it is. The law of God reveals his will for us in leading holy lives. But then the Holy Spirit does use the law of God in three different ways. It's not up to the preacher to decide which use I intended, not even during pastoral care. The Spirit uses the word to call us to repentance, to call us to faith. He uses the law, he uses the gospel. But there are times when we notice a difference in how the law tastes. Sometimes it doesn't taste sweet anymore. It tastes <coughs> bitter. It tastes like it's wrong. Why? Because we realize we have not measured up. We have failed. 
We have even broken the law. We have not done the good that we have been given to do, and instead have done the evil that God said no to. Is it still the third use? Nope. The Lord, the Spirit, is using the law, second use, to call you to repentance, so that again we would be reminded of the forgiveness of sins in Jesus. It's a harsh thing to hear from Jesus an answer that doesn't get him in trouble with the government. It is interesting to hear from Jesus the plain, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And it is amazing to have Jesus quote scripture back at this biblical scholar of the law of God with words that he should have learned in Sunday school, or at least the Old Testament. We are given to love the Lord with all that we are and all that we have. We are given to love our neighbor as ourselves. But we don't. Perfectly. And it's a great reminder that the law was not designed to save us. The Savior is the one who saves us. You know his name, Jesus Christ. He even gives you the faith to trust him with. On those two commandments do depend all the law and the prophets. And Jesus kept both perfectly. He kept all ten commandments perfectly. He did that for you as your substitute. Later on, Jesus asks a question himself. Not to get anybody into trouble, but to draw out their faith, their trust in the Lord, their trust in him. David calls him Lord because he is God. David has a son, a descendant according to the flesh, and it is also Jesus, only the God-man could be the Savior that we need. Only the God-man could answer questions this way. Only the God-man gives us faith to hold on to Him and be reminded not to put our trust in princes, but in the Savior who gives us forgiveness, life, and salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Benedictus is our canticle at morning prayer. Page 238. Please sing. <laughs>
Let us pray. O God, because without you, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, bless your church here in this place and scattered throughout the world. Fill all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with his love, that they might strive diligently to love you, one another, and all their neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, enrich all pastors in Christ in all speech and knowledge, that they would preach the gospel in its purity and administer the sacraments according to Christ's institution. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, you know how Satan prowls like a roaring lion, seeking to devour your children. By the power of your word and spirit, protect and defend those who are under Satan's attack. Send your holy angels to be with them, that the evil foe may have no power over them. Lord, in your mercy. Generous Lord, we thank you for the delight in giving us all good gifts. Continue to bless us in both body and soul. Grant us generous hearts, that we would support your ministry and mission among us and around the world with our tithes and offerings. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Eternal Father, give guidance, wisdom, and safety to Donald, our president. Mark, our governor, to all who make and judge our laws. Bless all civil servants as they carry out their offices and protect them in the line of duty. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, continue to be merciful to all those who are suffering under the burden of any illness or ailment of body, soul, or spirit, especially Roy, Clinton, Pauline, Rosalind, Arvid, Sharon, Patricia, Carolyn, Nancy, and Evelyn. Strengthen and heal them according to your will, and bless all the hands that care for them. Lord, in your mercy. God of God, and Lord of Lords, we give you thanks for all who have preceded us in the faith and now rest from their labors. We ask you especially to be with all of the Lenz family as they mourn dead. Sustain us in the same faith as we wait with them for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be found guiltless on the day of judgment. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we have fallen to no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Talk of our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Yes. 
Voters meeting today after the 10.30 a.m. service. A3 confirmation class resumes today from 1.30 to around 3 o'clock. And on Tuesday, we have all the meetings. Lord be praised.